you can harvest the inner bark and cut it oh. and make noodles with it. Wait, birch? So you could, yeah, birch tree, you take the inside of the bark and you cut it up like noodles. And really? then you put it in your, you know, cast iron or something like that. What? And that yeah. one? That's yeah. Tree? What? Yeah, I That's just crazy. learned that. Birch a noodles. Days ago. It's gonna be a new Birch like it's two years is gonna be a trend. I'm predicting right now. <laughs> People are gonna be bored of zucchini noodles. They're gonna be over it. Yeah. The birch noodles. We're Pure Planets. My name is Gina. I'm Marissa. And we met about four years ago, and created Pure Planets out of a love that we both had for the natural world. We both have studied as herbalists. Sustainability and education are the foundation of our creation. Mm -hmm. So, so much of what we do is in relationship to humanity and the earth, building relationship, being aware of what we're intaking, being aware of what this earth is constantly providing us and understanding how to be in relationship with it and to learn from it. Um, we hold a lot of workshops, um, sometimes do like a five-week series, and we're world travelers. So we've spent the past three years um, going to many different countries and studying the cultures and different plants that have been used in these different countries. And now are really excited to ground down here in Colorado, which is a big deal for us. Roots. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, and Me with too. that, yeah. we're, we're working to find analogs. So right now we're, we're on this mission to understand, okay, we've found all these very exotic plants around the world. How can we find plants here in Colorado that have similar qualities? Mm -hmm. What should I expect on the tour? Ooh. Well, we'll take you on a, on a plant walk. We hope to take you to the, the subtlety and to explore some of the smaller plants that are actually very potent. So mm -hmm. we'll be speaking about what we see um, and just go along with us, you know, we'll go for a walk and if we feel inspired then we'll pull over and talk about a plant, what we know about it, what we feel about it. So here we have Mullen, Verbascum thapsis is its name, and it's very soft and woolly. The leaves are just so gentle and they kind of resemble lamb's ear. And this is a first year plant because we can see that it's only just growing the basil leaves. Um, it's second year, which we'll see in a moment, um, will shoot up a very tall stalk and start to flower these really beautiful yellow flowers. But this year is the year you want to harvest the flowers, I mean the leaves. And this is when you can just pluck them off right at the base and try not to take too many per plant, you know, find a stand that's really abundant. It grows really, really abundantly here in Colorado and it tends to like these kind of drier soils. Um, so you'll see them on mountainsides and along the road and along streams. It just, it's not a very picky plant. It will grow most places and it grows all over the U.S. Um, but yeah, it's just this really gentle, soft plant and I just love it. It's, it's a really, really beautiful medicine um, for the lungs. So it's a typical plant that's used um, for any sort of irritating cough. And I like to make a tea out of it. Um, I'll harvest the leaves and keep them dry in a jar or I also use them fresh um, for tea. But the main thing with the tea is that if you make it, it's a really gentle taste, but you'll wanna make sure that you strain it out really well with either a cloth or some sort of cheesecloth because there's really tiny little hairs that will get in there and um, actually irritate you. So it kind of, it works and it also does what it works on. So if you have an irritating dry cough, Mullen is the plant for you. Just make sure to strain the hairs out of the teas. But it's a really, really beautiful plant and it grows so abundantly. And yeah, this is the first year plant that you can use the leaves for. You can also dry the leaves and smoke them. So if you're interested in that, if you're working on quitting smoking, it's an incredible plant to use. You just pull a couple of leaves off, you dry them, and then it's really nice to crumple them up with your hands. And maybe you do that on a full moon or a new moon or a half moon, and you're just really clear with your intentions on needing to let go or if you're letting go of a lover, whatever it may be in your life. Because this plant grows so abundantly, I really feel like everyone should be using it. Um, a lot of the times you'll see it in smoke blends, but you really, if you're smoking it, to clear your lungs, which is 
possible. You don't want to mix it with anything. So you can almost like you would roll a joint or something like that, just roll your dried mullein. And it's actually really clearing for your lungs. But don't mix it with tobacco because then it contradicts it. And for some reason, people tend to do that a lot. So if we look over here, you can see the two-year plant. It's in its second year. And um, you can see the seeds here on the top, as well as these little yellow flowers. And I wish they were here right now. Across the way, you can see the, the colors shimmering. But essentially, these yellow flowers are so good for swimmer's ear. So if you mix the yellow flowers with garlic and a little bit of olive oil, you have an incredible ear medicine. So you put a couple drops of that in. Of course, research it a bit more, but just so you know, you can also use these. So yeah, back in the Middle Ages, they would take this stalk and cut it and then they would dip the flower part, this whole aerial part, in some sort of lard or fat, and they would burn it as a torch. So I just love that because envisioning that we were using mullen torches, and you could totally do that these days as well. I love mullen. It's one of the most abundant weeds that we have here, and it's so full. It gives itself in its leaf and the flower and the stalk itself, and they're all medicinal, and it's all ready to be used and intended to and connected with so we love mullen and next to the mullen here we've got a little friend we have some wild lettuce might as well point that out and you can identify the lettuce from the prickles here on the back and Gina always says you know it's like we eat lettuce and we we feel like it's this really simple soft plant when in reality, this is where it comes from. It's a bitter, it's very strong. So again, really good for the liver, for detoxing, overall healthy, healthy plant. Right now it's flowering, so we probably won't harvest it, but you'll see this everywhere in Colorado and feel free to eat it just like you would a salad or saute it like you would saute your spinach. Yeah, you definitely wanna cook it because the leaves can be, at least when they're young, you could still eat it, but you wanna cook it down because otherwise it might be a little sharp. It you is also cooked. Well, you can nibble on it, but you want to be careful of the thorns. Right. But, you know, if you cook it down and soften it all up enough, it should be fine. Just put some vinegar on it if you're going to eat it raw. Yeah. <laughs> and maybe just cut the, cut the spine, but... Yeah, and it's really, like, it's not the most delicious tasting food, you know? So it's like little bits would be fine. And I think mainly it's used as a medicine, but, you know, it's just cool to see, like, where lettuce came from because we're just so... Everything's been so softened and so um, hybridized to be like human friendly that I love seeing this reminder of like, this is what lettuce was before it was humanized. And I just think it's important to see that. Like it had its own defense. It had thorns all up and down it. And now it's not. So I just like it. It's, to me, it's a reminder of like the innate wildness that exists in nature that we've, you know, kind of dulled down for our own eating pleasures, but at the same time this still exists and it's still very much true to its nature and mm -hmm. how do you make like a basic tincture of something just harvest depends on the plant let's say you're you're harvesting fresh some lemon balm or any type of plant you've researched you know that it's good to tincture it first of all fill your jar up usually a mason jar cover it with alcohol usually an everclear works really well you do need like a 90 proof alcohol Sometimes we use tequila because you, for yeah, cordials and elixirs. You don't necessarily have to use that high. It's like it, when you want to start knowing exactly how much alcohol is in your tincture, you can use these like really high proofs, but then you ultimately usually end up diluting it down. So our favorite way is just to use a, like a tequila or a vodka, like a 90 to 100 proof, and then you have half water and half alcohol, and that's mm. plenty to preserve the tincture. So essentially, in a clear way, you just harvest your plants, you fill a mason jar, you pour your alcohol over it, you shut the mason jar, and you leave it in a cool and dry place for one whole moon cycle. Then you strain the alcohol and you have a tincture. That's amazing. Yeah. It's so simple and, you know, there's a lot of nuances in, in making medicine. You can... You know, like she said, you fill the jar so you can decide whether you want to make a fresh plant tincture or a dried plant tincture, depending on the plant, you know, and depending on the season. So say you have an abundance of 
lemon balm and you want to make a tincture, I personally prefer to use fresh plants if possible. But maybe I have so much lemon balm that I'm going to end up drying it for a little while. And then you can make a dried plant tincture. And it's, they're going to be really different, actually, in the way that they taste and the way, not necessarily in their actions, but in the way that they taste and the way they look. So you just, you get to play, you know, that's the beauty of herbal medicine. And tinctures are one of the easiest ways to play because you can't really go wrong. Like, unless you somehow let a big chunk of the medicine, um, like the plant material, be uncovered. Um, and not in the alcohol, you risk mold. But as long as you cover it with alcohol, you're gonna be fine. And it won't go bad, so you can give no. it to your grandchildren. <laughs> yeah, wow. your grandchildren's grandchildren can use your tinctures. Yeah. It's really true though, they found a, an apothecary that was abandoned in a forest for, for centuries. And the medicine was still viably um, active. So it just goes to show that like the alcohol, it's used for a reason and it's, it's because it's such a brilliant preserver. It, it takes the alcohol extractive components of plants and it also has water in it and it takes the water soluble parts and when you combine it all, you get this really, really potent medicine that is good for life. So I'm a big fan of tinctures. I think, you know, there's other ways to use plant medicine too and teas are a really amazing way um, because they're so simple and they're the most, one of the most ancient ways. It's mm. like plants in water as tea, you know, it's simple. Um, but tinctures are great and they're really good for people who have a busier lifestyle that can't take that time to make a tea But then I would ask them, you know, if you're really trying to get healthy Why can't you take that time to make a tea? So I think there's There's a convenience to them and we still always want to invite people to take those moments for themselves to make a tea Instead because it's just a different it's a different energetic imprint of the plant um, tinctures are also a lot more fiery because they're in this like, you know, fire water or like spirits. Um, they have a different effect on the body than a water extraction. So there's just, I love medicines because you get a play and you get to try what feels really true to you. Mm -hmm. um, when I travel, I bring a whole slew of tinctures with me because that's just the easiest way to travel with them. And I, I don't know if I'm going to have access to a stove and clean water, so I at least know I have my tincture with me. And, and just take a few drops and I also really like working with tinctures in small doses you don't have to take like a huge dropper full every day necessarily you can work on a more spirit level with the plant and just take a few drops and it actually works in a whole different way so we can talk about it all for days but I obviously really love medicines and the different ways you can make them and really love teaching people how to make them because it's so simple it's like put your plant in a jar cover it and let it sit and that's literally it's that simple. And then if you add honey, you have a cordial. <laughs> oh, the best. <laughs> yeah. Always add honey. When yeah. in doubt. When in doubt, add honey. Unless you're making bitters and then don't add honey. Mm -hmm. Juniper. So this is our sweet juniper. I don't remember the Latin name. I think, I think it's juniperus. Yeah. I don't really remember, honestly. It's a beautiful, beautiful plant and I wish I could just give you the smell through the camera. Um, you know, this plant in general, again, it's really good to be around, you know? Harvest this plant, just a little sprig, and keep it in your car or bring it onto your altar, into your room. You know, it's really good to burn. It's been used for thousands of years in that way as a way of clearing and providing protection. There are no berries right now, but the berries are very high in vitamin C. And they're also incredible for people who are trying to quit smoking. Firstly, because when you're putting stuff in your mouth, it kind of distracts you from wanting to pick up a cigarette. Um, always spit out the seeds. And then I just read recently that it actually helps to expel the tobacco and nicotine in your lungs. So if you're working with wow. that, you can put them in your pocket, you know, just harvest a few. And um, just a good plant to know it grows everywhere. And there's many different species of juniper and they all look a bit different. There's alligator juniper that has um, this really interesting bark that looks like scales. And then I don't know exactly which one this is. I would like to remember more, but um, this one has a very delicate, delicate leaf. And the color is even unique as well. It's yeah. kind of chartreuse and like neon white in a way. And yeah, it's again like... Juniper is a really beautiful example of an abundant plant that we can use for um, cleansing smoke or sacred smoke. 
that is not white sage. So I'm trying to teach people to get away from using these endangered plants and mm -hmm. go towards plants that are a lot more abundant mm -hmm. and local. So like sage doesn't grow here. We have our own ver versions of sage, which is actually an artemisia. But then, you know, we're importing sage from California or wherever, and it doesn't grow um, here. So I think it's really beautiful when we can steer people towards finding smudge plants that actually grow, that they can harvest themselves. And for example, this is a tree. So if we harvest just a little bit, it's not going to affect it in any negative way. Actually, made me make it stronger, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We might help it along. And of course, you always want to give offerings when you, when you harvest plants and that can come in any form that you feel comfortable. But I really, really love juniper as a smudge or as a, a way of cleansing the space. Mm -hmm. When you say give offerings, like, and you say, of course, so if somebody doesn't necessarily know what that means, like, what would you suggest? Or what's the connection there? Yeah, yeah, I mean, you can offer your hair, you can offer your saliva. It's really just a way of like, giving a piece of you back to the plant since you're taking a piece of it hmm. so i also really like to offer songs that feel authentic and genuine to share um, you can offer tobacco as a very traditional way um, any plant that you have a connection to so like some rose petals but yeah an offering could be a song or your own hair it doesn't have to be a thing but plants do really love honey and whiskey good i'm always singing <laughs> in my song so yeah sing, my trees, sing. yeah yeah i love it beautiful Everywhere we are is exactly what we need. So no matter where you are on the planet, the medicine that the people of that area are going to need is going to be there because nature is ingenious. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the, it's just a matter of opening the eye to see a little deeper and look a little closer. I like to call it breaking the green wall, which was a, a term that my first teacher, Frank Cook, bestowed upon me, which kind of just speaks to this idea of like when we look out in nature, we just see a big wall of green. But then if we start to get closer and we start to see beyond that like just green veil we can see and get to know like friends you know i call them plant allies because they are they're there to help us they're there to teach us they're there to heal us and they're there to be food and then likewise we are then stewards of them and help them spread their seeds so by getting to know familiars and getting to develop a relationship with this larger wall we become actually uh, co-creators of our environment versus just witnesses to it. So I think to answer your question about like, is each place, each place to me is as diverse as the Amazon. Of course, yeah. there's not that many species, but there are that, there's that potential of healing and there's that, there's gonna be something that does this and that wherever we are. This is Elm. Yes. That is. And I just wanted to point it out because there's uh, a lot of people know about slippery elm. It's in like a lot of lozenges or any sort of sore throat remedy because it's really what we call mucilaginous, meaning goopy and slimy. And so it's really nice to find other plants that can do that because slippery elm is actually endangered now because it's been harvested so much for that purpose. But we have our own elm. We have a local elm here mm. and it can be used really similarly. So I like to just take a little chunk of it off and put it in my water bottle and over time it'll get really goopy and it does just the same exact thing so the bark can be used and you know there's a whole thing about harvesting barks that we won't necessarily get into in this video and so you don't even have to heat it up as a tea you can literally just put it in your water and yeah, leave it for a couple hours and you're yep. good to go yep and you can heat it as well yeah okay. either one I like to do both um, because different constituents will come out in a hot tea or a cold tea, but with mucilaginous components, they really do like cold infusions. That so word. we'll talk about mucilaginous. Like mucilaginous. Yeah, we'll talk about that more when we find some marshmallow, hopefully, because uh -huh. that's like the queen of of mucilage. Mucilage. And women. <laughs> mucilage on. Women, you want that? We need for it. a moist vagina and for we live in a, for vitality. Yeah, <laughs> we live in a dry place, so yeah. we need all the mucilage we can get. Mucilage, you gotta get it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, gotta stay hydrated. There's some sticky gum weed coming up. I hope. Yeah. This is one of my favorite plants. <laughs> um, when I first came to Colorado, I met her. Sticky gum weed. So as you can see, it's quite sticky. That's why they call it sticky gum weed. Literally, when you touch it, your hands get all sticky. My favorite way to use this medicine is in a honey. Oh, wow. um, so maybe we can harvest this for you if you're yeah. interested. I've got some um, fresh honey. Look, the bees, the bees love it. Just take off 
the flour here. And then when you go home, you'll just take like, normally a ball jar works just fine, and you'll literally put these flowers into the ball jar, fill it with honey, and let it infuse for at least a moon cycle. And um, ideally you'll have this medicine in the winter. It's really good for digestion, um, any sort of tummy ailment. And then also because it's so sticky, it actually pulls that kind of toxic phlegm, phlegm in the body out. So the doctrine of signatures is a really fun thing to explore. Essentially the doctrine of signatures says that we can understand what medicine a plant has by looking at it. So this, hmm. for example, tells us, okay, it's really sticky, so that means when we ingest this into our body, it's going to help with this type of um, a constitution. Gina, do you want to say anything else about it? Well, yeah, just going off of what you're saying with the doctrine of signatures too, like it has these little hooks almost. So to me, it's like a beautiful... Uh, a beautiful doctrine of like the fact that it's gonna like pull things out of your lungs it's gonna like hook the mucus and help you expel it so it's traditionally what's called an expectorant and that means it helps to loosen and remove phlegm oh. uh, which is really helpful because a lot of times here in Colorado it's so dry again we mm -hmm. get that like kind of stuck mucus and so this is a brilliant plant to help just loosen it and let it go and it also grows really abundantly. It would be considered a weed perhaps. So again, that's why we want to talk about it here because it, there's a lot of plants that we like to use that are just a little more endangered. So one that grows here is called OSHA and it's a brilliant, brilliant expectorant and overall lung medicine. But this is an analog that we can use that grows right near it. It's everywhere. And it's very abundant. Yeah, so it's, it's a great one and it tastes delicious and um, I love just nibbling on it and smelling it alone. It just, it just feels good. Yeah, and you never want to take more than like 10% of a plant. So just be aware. But as you can see, there are many different patches here, right? So we'll go to the different patches and take your time. You know, sometimes I just follow my hand too and it'll just, the flowers will tell you what wants to be harvested. Don't think about it too much. Maybe you'll see some bees and bugs around a certain flower. Don't pick that one. Just yeah. respect and know that that we're in relationship. So I, I, how much honey to ratio? ratio? You just want to fill the jar. So anytime you're making medicine, you want to fill the jar with the plant as much as you can. And then you want to pour, whether it's honey or alcohol, over it and not leave air. Because air is where, you know, bacteria okay. and oxygen will come in and like kind of damage the medicine. So you just want to fill it. And once it's sat for say a month, then do I strain it out or yep. do I just, yep. then just use the honey? This one you could leave in, you, leave it. you know, you, you could, honey? yeah. If you, you want a clean these? honey, you could strain it out. Know. You know, you, I've been told that you can and then I did it and I found that there was a lot of really sh um, sharp little barbs okay, that got stuck in my it. gums. So I wouldn't recommend it. No, okay. But put your honey, put a spoonful of your honey in your tea. Yeah. And then you'll really, you know, it'll get all mushy at the end of your tea, but keep it in. I, I, anytime I make this with honey, I, I never strain it out. So that's cool. an option. And Good. feel free to put it right in the warm water. Cool. It's really yummy in the wintertime. Yeah. So this is linden tree or tilia species. And it grows really, really abundantly here in Colorado. It's actually been planted as an ornamental, like all throughout Boulder, and even out in Lafayette, farther suburbs, there it's just growing everywhere. So it's a really great plant to learn because it's actually a tree. And it was revered in Europe for years and years and years and still is as the tree of justice. So they would plant it like in front of the, you know, these important political buildings and find that it helped to bring just a peace and a calm there. And so they could, they could come to an agreement with each other rather than doing this duel and this fight. And they found that the essence of this tree would bring that balance. So it actually does something really similar in our bodies. It helps to calm the nervous system and it calms the heart. And it, I work with it a lot as a heart medicine. So if someone's going through a breakup or they're just feeling like overwhelmed by the world, which is quite common these days, <laughs> um, this tree is a really beautiful ally to have because it just offers a calming effect. And I personally use it all the time because it tastes amazing. Um, again, it has kind of a mucilaginous quality to the tea, 
which is something you can't buy commercially. It doesn't exist yet. I mean, it's I'm starting to see it in blends, but for the most part, harvesting it on your own is like the best way to utilize the medicine. So you can identify it from these, these kind of heart-shaped leaves that are really soft. They're really soft. And then it has these bracts that kind of look like the helicopter maple things, but they're not. And then it would have flowers, but the flowers are gone now and it's turning into a little seed. Um, but the flowers smell incredible. They're these white kind of like hand shaped looking flowers that just the bees are insane over and it'll be covered in bees and insects and you just come under it and it's so alive. And um, yeah, I like to just harvest the aerial parts. So I just take the leaves and the fresh flowers and I dry them in a basket. And in Colorado, it dries in like a day or two. And then I stuff it in a big jar and I have tea for the rest of the year. And this year I also made an elixir. So I just put the fresh flowers and the fresh leaves in a big ball jar and added a little bit of honey and covered it in tequila, which is my personal favorite way. And I can't wait to open it. It's gonna be so delicious in the winter and have that like essence of summer. Talk about it. a present. It's a yeah. present I'm giving yeah. to myself <laughs> and all my friends. So yeah, I think it's just, it's one of the most beautiful trees and it's, it, um, yeah, someone agrees. Yeah, he, he's a big fan of... Oh, yeah, you want to do it when just it's this. in the flower. Not the leaf. Oh no, you get the leaf. The leaf, too. oh, you're saying not the seed, okay. You just want to do it when it's flowering. Okay. But like now is not ideal. Yeah, this is what they were, want. yeah. That's when you want to harvest the but tea. But you'll smell them. You'll yeah, you want to harvest when it's flowering. Because okay. it's just, it's like harvesting honeysuckle or something. Like there's this really vanilla-like scent. And so you want the leaves, but you could just use the leaves. Like if you miss the flower, you could still use the leaves and it would be a really, really wonderful tea. Good for children too. Yep. So before bedtime, before bath time, a little bit of linden tea with some catnip. Oh yeah. So oh. right a down. nervine dream. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and of course for us too. This is a good example of some symbiosis happening. There's a tree that's, uh, this is an alder tree that's just really struggling to survive. Um, but then below it, we have um, two very friendly wild weeds that we work with a lot. They've gotten a little dirty from the lawnmower, but um, this is burdock. Um, Arcticum sapa. And I think that's right. And um, yeah, it's a really amazing plant. So this is similar to the mullen that we saw earlier where it's the first year's growth. It's just the basil leaves. Um, when it starts to be on its second year, it's gonna shoot up a stalk just like the mullen did. And this one is a really, really amazing plant. It's used as food all throughout the world. In Japan, they call it gobo. And it's used in sushi, it's used in soups and stocks. It's um, one of the best sources of a prebiotic fiber called inulin. So we know all about probiotics now, but we actually need prebiotics to feed the probiotics. Mm. So this is a really good ally to have and know about because it feeds the probiotics. So without that, they're kind of pointless to use. Yeah. Um, I use it as a food. I just take the, the um, root that you can buy in the store now and chop it up and put it in my st my stocks and my stir fries and soups. The one that I've cooked with is really thin and skinny and long. Mm -hmm. Is that the same? It is. Definitely. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's grown commercially, so it's a little different than yeah. like a wild one, but at the same time, it's the same one. And yeah, the roots go really, really deep to the point where it's quite challenging to harvest sometimes. So you gotta have time and patience and a will to get the root. Um, and again, that's and something we do in the fall. You gotta yeah. have a good shovel and maybe wait till after a good rain because it is really hard and you don't want to dig really deep for a while and then break it off and you can't actually get the root. So uh -huh. it's meant to harvest with intention for sure. Everyone should be using this plant. Um, and that's of course my opinion, but it grows so abundantly here. So to me, it's, it's obvious we need to be using it. We're also a very toxic uh, society. And this is a, it's a bitter, but it's a liver cleanser. It clears the toxins out of your body. So I actually tincture, we tincture burdock every year, which is pretty simple. You just harvest the root. I like to chop it up, put it in a fresh. jar. Yeah, fresh. Oh wow. Put it in a jar and just wait one moon cycle and you'll be ready to go. Um, usually before a meal, after a meal, just really good to have around in general. Yellow dock actually is right over here as well. Oh. A mixture of these two roots is just incredible. It's a really, really good 
bitter blend. Um, and we have to remember too, you know, our liver and our gallbladder, all of that is um, influencing the way that we see the world. It actually influences our eyesight. It influences our ability to envision and to create. So to me, it's not just about, okay, we're clearing a toxin. It's like we're working in five element theory, for example, it's with the wood element. It's, it's, what, it's the energy of what makes a tree grow, right? So the more in which we can understand the energetics behind medicine, the better. So I just see it as an ally um, for us right now and continuing to envision this new world and simultaneously clear our systems out. Also, if you're going to a potluck, um, oftentimes we'll have parties and we'll use these as plates. So these ones are, the lawnmower has clearly hit it and they're not the best example, but these leaves will get like big, big, big. And so you can, style. you can harvest like 15 of them and then everyone can have these as their plate at the potluck or at whatever gathering you're having. Or if you want to do like hors d'oeuvres on a burdock leaf, really yep. fun. Fancy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so you, you wouldn't eat the them. leaf? But you, you can, can eat you them. Can eat you the can, leaf. yeah. It's a little tough. I would blanch it first or something. You know, think of it like a collard green perhaps because yeah and you can burn the root as well so osha for example gina mentioned you know very over harvested a sacred plant that really should be left mostly for the bears um burdock root if you burn it it's very similar so that's another medicine that you can use to um, build your connection with spirit and and form some protection around you awesome yeah so here's the cottonwood Feel a little makeup majestic cottonwood trees are my favorite yeah so one way to identify cottonwood is this like really deep bark so you can see like almost my entire hand fits inside of the ridge of the bark wow. which is a really unique characteristic to cottonwood can we have a quick side note and teach them how to smell a tree yeah <laughs> Duh. Gina has good tricks about smelling trees <laughs> so one one of my favorite things about trees is their smell and sometimes when it's really been dry which is another constant thing we're working with here in Colorado is it's not like one of those lush moist places so I like to bring the lushness myself so what I'll do is I'll put my nose up to the tree smell it mm, not really getting a scent but then I do this like you're fogging a mirror and then I smell that spot and it like it alivens the tree oh. yeah. so the scent becomes moist and alive so there's a really strong um, like mulch around right now. It smells like yeah. <laughs> like uh, manure, yeah. but I yeah. even still could get a little bit of the cottonwood scent <laughs> beyond that. Um, but that's a fun way to, to get trees to smell a little more if they're not already. But normally this tree you can just smell it right on its own. And another identifier is the leaves. So they look like little hearts. I think there's a small little sprout. There we go. Yeah. Yeah, they've got little heart-shaped leaves that look really similar to aspen leaves and poplar trees and they're all the poplar species okay. so that's another kind of confusing thing because all these trees are sometimes referred to as poplar but that's just because they're all in the same family so this is the poplar cottonwood and as you can see it's just quite majestic it has a presence that you can feel really far away and it was one of the most sacred trees for the native peoples that lived here and it still is today. Uh, they use it in a lot of different ceremonies. And personally, I like to make medicine out of the buds. So in the summer, like the very early spring, not summer, in the spring, the buds will fall down from the tree after a good windstorm. And that's where I gather them. I never pick directly from the tree because I just like to be as in in invasive uninvasive as possible um, so like if there's something on the ground that i can harvest freely then i'll always do that so with cottonwood it's really easy it just does that the wind is your ally and then you collect the buds your hands will get all sticky there'll be this really amazing resin that smells completely unique to cottonwood and i put those buds in a jar and cover it with olive oil and let it sit for a moon cycle or two i want it to get really infused and then you strain that out and you have this beautiful infused oil that's amazing for healing any sort of wounds, um, skin conditions like wow. eczema, psoriasis, um, athlete's foot. It works on all of those levels because it's an antifungal, antibacterial, antiviral actually. And it's 
it's a medicine I try not to go a year without making because I notice if I don't make it for one year, I run out and I don't like running out because I love it so much. <laughs> and yeah, the spirit of cottonwood is just, uh, to me, it's like one of the most comforting feelings ever. Just being near it, I instantly feel my nervous system relaxing and I go back to this kind of childlike state of wonder and um, appreciation for nature. I've actually harvested goldenrod. So when you guys are walking, do you, like, I know for me when I go on a hike now, I'm just looking at greens all the time. Yeah. Is that kind oh of a thing? God, all like, the time. Yeah. Everywhere it's we go. <laughs> but I mean, oftentimes yeah. we're not always going in parks like this. I mean, ideally, for me, my passion is wild weeds. So I love wild edible plants because I feel like it helps us connect to our own innate wildness. So in a park like this, you know, there's not much to look on on the ground like it's it's mostly just grasses but yeah. hiking and stuff like that of course and we're always munching and eating and hopefully we can find some wild weeds around here I think by the water there should be some but honestly you could harvest like the biggest salad in one 20 minute walk here in Colorado and you'd be surprised to see um, the abundance of a very iron rich foods mm -hmm. Yeah, and even amongst this like very manicured lawn, you can still see like plantain poking through and dandelions and yeah, they're just so resilient. Like these wild hot. weeds, like I think they're, there's a resurgence of appreciation because we're kind of having to take on that energy ourselves. Like we're having to push through concrete and like break through these old ways and like these plants are the perfect example of how to do that in a way that's very gentle um, but so strong. I mean, the fact mm. that dandelions can grow in concrete, you know, all the all the all plants the wild first lane yeah but you know you don't want to harvest here it's like how do we know that they're not spraying with yeah. pesticides yeah they definitely are so here. to just be aware of where you're harvesting always and in that case that's why i like to go you know into the forest into the woods hiking in places where really there's just not a manicured lawn because if there's a manicured lawn most likely there's some chemicals around that you will then be ingesting so if we want to learn more do you have like social media, email, that kind of stuff? Yeah, of course. So just pureplanets.com is our website. Pureplanets at gmail.com is our email address. We're always checking our emails. Um, Instagram is at pureplanets. And even if you just want to go for a walk with us, like one-on-one, -on -one, no problem, reach Groups, out. bachelorette parties. Yeah. That would be Come the bring best. your babes. Very Events. different bachelorette party, but that would be my kind. We do initiations. Yeah, yeah so we, we love talking about it up. sensuality and sexuality and sacred sexuality. I mean, it's all one and the same, right? But we have an array of topics in which we love to share about, and it's not just based on herbal medicine. So that's just the tip of the iceberg yeah yeah be in contact with us we'd love to know what you want to learn too and see if we can mm -hmm. give back to you in that way awesome mm -hmm.